much, uh, Osmani. I, I'm assuming everybody can hear and see me. So um, thank you for inviting me and for, uh, for this panel and to, to kick off the, the conference. It's been a pleasure to be associated with uh, all of the, uh, the previous conferences and, and the planning for this one and uh, to provide support as well through the College of Public Policy at Hamad bin Khalifa University that uh, Osmani was mentioning. Um, let me uh, see if I can start my uh, slides. Um, and one second. Uh, okay. uh, doing this for the first time, so let's, uh, ah, here we go, okay. So let me share, I just have a few slides um, that I will use as a basis for my, for my talk. So I'm presuming everybody can see these. So the title of my talk is um, The Paradox of Policy Diffusion. And let me state the paradox very baldly at the beginning and then I'll come back to it at the end. Uh, the paradox that I'm, I'm exploring, and it's more a hypothesis than a, an assertion, but the paradox that I'm exploring is that uh, in an age, uh, and with a particular issue like this pandemic, where we have more information, I think, than we've ever had before about the state of public policy and policy responses around the world, uh, the, the uh, level of coordination and policy diffusion is actually relatively low. So we have a, a surplus of information about comparative policy responses and a deficit, if you will, uh, or a very low level, I would, argue or hypothesize um, of actual diffusion and borrowing. And to some extent, this, uh, this contradicts the point that Osmani was making, the more optimistic point of view. So this is perhaps a more pessimistic take on, uh, on policy diffusion and, uh, and COVID. So um, at, at one level, everybody is aware that we've had, again, a relatively unprecedented amount of real-time information about the spread of the pandemic itself. I'm not talking about policy responses here. I'm talking about the actual problem and the virus and, and the spread of the pandemic. So these are two, <coughs> excuse me, these are two um, uh, very common sources of information about the spread of the virus. Each of these is just a couple of days old. Uh, the World Health Organization, which um, Osmani mentioned, and which I'll come back to uh, toward the end of my presentation, uh, provides real-time data on the spread of the pandemic. So behind all of this, of course, is a vast global apparatus of information gathering about the virus, its spread, and the collection of that information and its uh, diffusion or dispersion through, uh, through the website. The one that many people know and is cited continuously in the um, in the media as a, as, a, as a credible source of information is the John Hopkins University uh, Coronavirus Resource Center. Again, this is a, a tracker that tracks the uh, number of cases and global deaths, unfortunately, uh, and test results, uh, all of the mechanics, if you will, and the basic data about the, um, the pandemic itself. In addition to these, basic trackers of the phenomenon of the virus. We have, I believe, and I'd be happy to, to get comments from the audience and from my colleagues on the panel, we have, I believe, uh, unprecedented um, uh, amounts of real-time data about policy responses. So not the problem itself, not the virus per se, but what governments are actually doing to respond to the virus. And one would think, one would argue that, uh, or assume, that this wealth of data about what other governments are doing would then become a resource that governments themselves would be using to either coordinate their responses or borrow or diffuse the reactions and responses. And uh, anecdotally, at least, we've seen instances of something that I'll refer to in the final slide of biopolitical nationalism or corona nationalism where governments have actually tried to uncouple themselves from the global system of policymaking and global coordination. So uh, let me just walk through what some of these trackers are to give you a sense of the wealth of data and information that's actually available. So these are policy trackers. And policy trackers are a fairly common tool used by international organizations and NGOs, depending on the area that they're, they're interested in. So one example that almost everybody knows is uh, the um, 
Corruption Perceptions Index, which is put out by Transparency International. Uh, there's others like Freedom House, uh, the, the World Bank puts out governance indicators. So these are all indicators or trackers of one sort or another that try to capture an important phenomenon of, uh, of governance. And there are others that are actually also tracking government policy with respect, for example, to corruption, anti-corruption efforts. Global Integrity is a, an NGO that does this. But here, I think for the first time, we have a wealth of uh, policy tracker information about what governments are doing coming from a variety of largely international organizations that gives us unprecedented perspectives on at a very granular level about what it is that governments are actually doing. So here's one uh, by the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. This is their site on tackling coronavirus and controlling the, um, uh, contributing to the global effort. Uh, this is a policy tracker that uh, looks at three broad areas, uh, fiscal and monetary policy, employment and social policy, and health policy responses. Uh, it also, however, includes data on educational policy, science and innovation, tax, and, and even the supply of disinfectants. Uh, the scope of the countries is a little bit different for each of the um, vectors of policy that they're examining. Uh, but the core um, of, the, uh, of, of the sample consists of OECD country member states and uh, G20 non-OECD member states. Uh, a second tracker, again from the OECD, is the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, and this is an, uh, an OPSI COVID-19 innovation response tracker. So in this instance, uh, the observatory, which is an observatory of innovation, is looking at or trying to track um, um, innovate, innovative policy responses. So not everything that governments are doing, but ones that are considered to be innovative. Uh, governments themselves submit their, uh, their innovations. Uh, and right as of about a week ago, a little, uh, a little longer than that, uh, this particular tracker had a data set of over 400 self-nominated policy innovations that have been put forward by uh, 57 different countries, including uh, the European Union and the European Commission. Uh, the leading categories uh, of uh, innovations fell in the digital technology realm, and that's quite understandable, uh, given that many of the policy responses have had to do with digital tracking, tracing, contact tracing, etc. Uh, a third tracker is put out by the International Labour Organization, and this um, is a tracker on social protection issues or social protection policies. Uh, this tracker uh, is uh, quite uh, panoptic. It covers 195 countries and it has 1,130 different measures or indicators of uh, policy response, um, of which uh, unemployment protection, income protection, housing, and special allowances account for over 50% of the uh, of the indicators or measures they're also looking at uh, health and food security uh, and um, uh, the uh, the sources that they're drawing from are primarily media reports and some government reports that are published online so 195 countries covered uh, over 1,000 different measures uh, of policy responses in a whole host of social protection um, areas uh, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, also puts out a, um, a policy responses to COVID-19 uh, policy tracker. You would expect, whereas the International Labor Organization, the ILO, is focused on labor-related issues and social protection, the IMF is concerned more with financial policy responses. Um, but again, it's very comprehensive. It covers 196 countries and reviews fiscal policy responses, and these include spending measures on health, support for households and firms, uh, and tax measures. It looks at monetary and macro financial policy, so interest rates, bond markets, liquidity provision, bank credit. So what I was discussing were the first four of these policy trackers, the OECD's um, more comprehensive um, tracker of policies, to the uh, OECD's OPSI, the ILO, and then I had just mentioned the, um, uh, the IMF focusing primarily on financial um, policy responses, but uh, again, covering a very large number of countries, 195. Uh, but it doesn't end there. We uh, also have um, the United Nations COVID-19 response. Um, 
this uh, includes the World Health Organization portal, but it's um, it's a more general uh, website that um, that provides uh, a uh, portal into the activities of a variety of different UN agencies, um, and. Uh, you know, I'm going to list all of the different types of agencies and their respective areas of responsibility to give you a sense, again, of the scope, the depth, and the range of, um, of policy issues that are being tracked here. So again, because this is the UN, an international organization, um, uh, it's, uh, it's addressing COVID through the lens of each one of these separate and distinct international responsibilities, so peacekeeping humanitarian assistance, economic and social development, the SDGs, environment, water and sanitation, human rights, drugs, crime, terrorism, for example, the impact of the virus in prisons uh, and exploitation through cybercrime, uh, children, women in particular as caregivers and frontline personnel and the unfortunate increase in domestic violence as a result of lockdowns, reproductive health, HIV AIDS, UN development program, food and agriculture, the food security issues, refugees, migration and mobility, again, um, uh, particularly around refugees and migrants, aviation, tourism, shipping, workers and jobs, education, information, communication, and technology. So each one of those areas is reflected by a different set of activities in the UN. And again, the policy responses uh, that are being generated through the UN system are all being tracked in that uh, particular uh, website. Uh, this one is um, produced by the Blavatnik School of Public Policy at Oxford University, and um, it is a coronavirus government response tracker, so it uh, is much more specific in its title about what it's doing. Uh, it is a um, bespoke, tailored uh, tracker that looks at 17 different indicators for more than 160 countries in three broad areas. It's looking at containment and closure measures, uh, school and workplace closings, public transportation, international and domestic travel. Secondly, at economic measures that governments have taken with respect to income support and fiscal measures. And then thirdly, health systems. So this has to do with testing, contact tracing, etc. What's unusual about this particular tracker is that they are trying to basically develop an index of what they call stringency, where governments are reacting uh, more or less stringently to or, or um, uh, more stronger responses to the pandemic through their policy measures uh, uh, in comparison to weaker ones. And unlike the other trackers, all the other trackers that I'm mentioning here, uh, the Blavatnik uh, government response tracker does actually try to compare countries along this particular metric of severity or stringency. Uh, this one is a COVID-19 observatory in Latin America and Caribbean. Uh, and uh, it is um, put out by uh, the, um, the UN agency, uh, uh, your Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, this one tracks um, and monitors, a, again, a host of policy initiatives undertaken by countries in that region. So movement restrictions, health um, policy interventions, economy, employment, social protection, uh, education, and gender. Um, and it also does this chronologically. So it's not only providing the responses in real time, it's also providing a kind of um, record of the intervention since uh, December and more intensively since Mar uh, March. Um, so what it can aggregate into is a rough index of the kind of activities, uh, not the, the wisdom or the impact of those activities, but it, uh, the, the level of activities that are being undertaken by different governments to respond. and. Uh, so they have, for example, entries under social protection that include cash transfers, food transfers, in-kind transfers, guarantees of basic services and other social protection. They have a labor index that looks at teleworking, paid work leave, um, paid sick leave, unemployment insurance, um, et cetera. And the final tracker uh, is a, a daily clock for COVID-19 in Arab countries, uh, the region that I'm currently in. And um, this one is put out by the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. Again, it's a UN um, entity. It is much closer to the, uh, the WHO and John Hopkins in that it provides a clock on cases, not on policy responses as such. But the background work that ESQUA is doing in response to the, uh, the crisis is definitely addressing policy issues. So there's a policy component that lies behind or in the background to this particular um, 
to this particular uh, uh, index. I had mentioned at the beginning the, um, the WHO uh, index uh, in conjunction with the, uh, the John Hopkins one. And there I was highlighting the fact that uh, at, at, the face of the WHO, the coronavirus tracker, is looking primarily or initially at the case, the, the, the case distribution and diffusion of the, of the pandemic. But it also has, uh, as Osmani was mentioning in his opening remarks, uh, a wide range of, uh, of data about country guidance. So it has become, uh, or it, uh, it presumes to be, a source of global standards and benchmarks and guidelines. Uh, again, to give a sense of, or, of the scope um, it's, uh, uh, it lists a set of guidelines around critical preparedness, readiness and response actions for COVID-19, country level coordination and monitoring, um, the risk communication and community engagement, surveillance, rapid response teams, standards for national libraries, et cetera, et cetera. So the point I'm making, uh, and this is the last slide, the point I'm making, I'm suggesting, I'm, I'm hypothesizing a bit of a paradox. Despite what would appear to be an unprecedented number of real-time policy trackers, there actually seems to be less diffusion than one would expect. Of, of course, some countries and some regions are borrowing from each other, uh, but um, uh, generally countries have taken fairly distinctive approaches, even if the ingredients are generally the same. So here's the paradox. Why, when there's a global problem and a global and global real-time comparative data at unprecedented levels, depths, and granularity on policy responses, has there been, relatively speaking, so little diffusion or borrowing or copying or even one would ar could argue coordination? So again, I'm not making a hard case for this. I'm exploring this as a, as a hypothesis. Lots of data, a surplus of policy trackers, but a deficit or a very low level of diffusion. So here are um, five different um, hypotheses as to why this is the case. And I'll do this quickly and then maybe we can return in that discussion. Uh, it's a global pandemic, number one, but the characteristics of that pandemic vary quite dramatically country by country uh, in terms of medical resources, level of economic development, uh, demographics, the, uh, the agedness of the population, the concentration of the population, the distribution in terms of urban centers and, uh, and rural. So every country and even down at the subnational level has such unique uh, configurations of, of conditions that uh, solutions don't travel very well in this instance. We can get very general ideas about standards and responses, but the solutions have had to be very granular, very local in many instances, if not you know, at the subnational level. So uh, the, this is a kind, of, a kind of crisis, a kind of policy problem uh, that even though it's global in character, is local in terms of its policy responses. So that's the first hypothesis. The second one is the possibility that uh, international organizations have been somewhat discredited in the WHO in particular. Um, it made mistakes at the beginning, um, uh, not just the US and Mr. Trump have made allegations about um, the WHO ignoring some of the data that was coming out of China. Uh, and uh, there's enough evidence to suggest that it was caught flat-footed in terms of its, uh, its general responses. And it's been cast in a somewhat negative light. Again, the paradox is that there's lots of activity going on at the WHO and other international organizations in the UN system, but uh, they've been somewhat tarnished in terms of their capacities, abilities, and contributions, uh, at least at the beginning of the pandemic. That may fade, but uh, this might also be an additional factor in halting or blocking uh, some of the potential policy transfer that may have occurred through those international organizations. Uh, a third hypothesis is that a lot of the policy solutions required a logic of closure, a logic of blockage, a logic of, uh, of, uh, of uh, pushing back on and not accept, of, of, of closing. Uh, uh, travel restrictions, of closing borders, etc. So whereas the logic of policy diffusion and policy transfer is one of borrowing, copying, openness, transborder movements, fast policy, to, to quote uh, Peck and Theodore, um, in this instance, this pandemic actually encouraged solutions that were um, had a completely different kind of logic, a logic of closure and re resistance and, and go it alone, rather than borrowing and, um, and, uh, um, and, uh, and movement. Uh, a fourth, um, uh, and this flows from the third one, a fourth uh, 
hypothesis is that the pandemic encouraged, um, and these are two terms that have uh, boiled up in the literature recently, corona nationalism in the context of the European Union, uh, and uh, another term that's um, been, been used is biopolitical nationalism. In both these instances, you have it have the going alone phenomenon that I was mentioning earlier, but also strangely competitive responses where we're either doing better or worse than comparator countries. And that sets up a logic again of, uh, of competition rather than collaboration or borrowing. And finally, um, in uh, the fifth possible um, contributor to this paradox is a comparison to the 2008 financial crisis. Some global crises generate collective response. We're all in it together and the uh, connect connectivity is such that only a global response will be able to, to address it. Um, and, but sometimes some international crises, and this is something that I personally need to think a little bit more about, but the pandemic, while it has the potential to generate and has obviously generated international coordination and cooperation and borrowing, also has the potential to generate a lifeboat mentality that we're, we're not all in it together uh, each each man, woman, and child for him or herself, and, and at the national level, this contributes to the kind of corona nationalism or the biopolitical nationalism that I was mentioning. So uh, again, this paradox of diffusion is something that I'm putting forward for discussion and as a hypothesis to try to pick up on this uh, this uh, distinction between the amount of information we have about policy responses and about the actual uh, diffusion and borrowing and coordination that's taken place around the world. Thank you. Thank you.